The United States Army of the Potomac fought in the American Civil War between 1862 and 1865. This army, often visited and closest to their president, deserved to be known, both then as well as now, as Mr. Lincoln's Army. The Army of the Potomac had survived several inept commanders early in its history. There was a striking transition from early war city regiments and state militias, troops recruited for only one to two years, to Billy Yank of the Middle War period, who hailed from the rural counties and states, who were now asked to serve Mr. Lincoln for three-year enlistments. This Army of the Potomac was a body of men that had survived the worst poundings and worst punishments that Confederate General Robert E. Lee and his vaunted Army of Northern Virginia could inflict. But Mr. Lincoln's army sustained itself long enough for the arrival of two commanders who could harness their fullest potential. Those commanders being Major General George Gordon Meade and Ulysses Simpson Grant. Under Grant's personal direction in 1864 and 1865, the Army of the Potomac became a federal agency of death, its sole purpose being the engagement and extinction of the Army of Northern Virginia. The Army of the Potomac finally proved its thirst for victory between April 2nd and April 9th, 1865. By the spring of 1865, the Army of the Potomac had become the ultimate predator, and the Army of Northern Virginia was their prey. The army who beat Lee in 1865 took three years to assemble and train to perfection. Who were these men that melded into a perfect fighting machine? Mr. Lincoln's army, the Army of the Potomac, was not wholly the fighting force that had lost at first Bull Run on July 21st, 1861. In the spring of 1862, General George B. McClellan was ordered to take several of those old regiments and brigades that had fought outside of Washington and joined them with newly recruited regiments. He then drilled them endlessly and formulated this force into an Army of the Potomac who would actually sail to Virginia and fight mostly along the James River to make an end run attack the south and east. The Army of the Potomac would fight from Williamsburg to Richmond in the Peninsula and Seven Days battles, sometimes on the attack and sometimes on the defense. These bloody and ultimately fruitless losses tempered the Army, and in the resulting 1862 campaigns of Second Manassas, Antietam, and Fredericksburg, proved that the Army of the Potomac would fight toe-to-toe -to -toe with its nemesis, the Army of Northern Virginia. The problem with the Army was not the mettle of the men, but rather with the leadership. Generals McClellan, McDowell, Pope, and Burnside were simply not up to the job. In May 1863, the Army of the Potomac, under Hooker, had smashed into the divided Army of Northern Virginia at Chancellorsville. The boys in blue had struck Lee hard, and the Army of Northern Virginia bent, but did not break. Lee regrouped, and his trusted commander, Stonewall Jackson, turned the tide. The rebels ultimately forced Hooker's army to retreat, the men were furious. In July 1863, the Army of the Potomac, now mostly comprised of arguably more hardy three-year regiments, fought their best fight of the war for three endless days. They sent the Army of Northern Virginia packing at Gettysburg in July 1863. There, 
Under another new commander, General George Gordon Meade, the army found that if allowed to stay locked with Lee, they could beat him. By the spring, 1864, President Abraham Lincoln appointed Ulysses S. Grant, the commander of all federal armies, and Grant decided to make his headquarters in the field, in the east, with the Army of the Potomac. The resulting overland campaign consisting of the battles of Wilderness, Spotsylvania, North Anna, and Cold Harbor, would speak with action Grant's command to the Army of the Potomac to chase, bloody, and disintegrate the Army of Northern Virginia. The death of Lee's army, and not the Confederate capital, would be the mission of Mr. Lincoln's army. The South could not survive. The battles of 1862 prove that a few of the many old city regiments in the army, these regiments being a fair percentage of the Army of the Potomac between April and December 1862, would establish a tough fighting reputation from the many city rogues and skinflints of New York, Boston, and Philadelphia. Sometimes these units were just ethnic clubs that had mustered into regiments to build a distinct esprit de corps. But none of these ethnic city regiments surpassed the reputation of the Irish Brigade. The Brigade was established from a nucleus of New York City regiments of exclusively Irish volunteers and were ultimately led by Brigadier General Thomas Francis Mahar, an Irish exile who was once to be executed by the English government. He was referred to as Mahar the Sword and would be fearless in battle and be loved by his men. His men were working class tradesmen, laborers, and dock workers from New York City. The 63rd, 69th, and 88th New York regiments fought well for McClellan around Richmond, but would seal its name to proper military fame by its attack at the Sunken Road at Antietam on September 17, 1862. The brigade marched into attack to crest the rise above the Sunken Road some 50 yards before the Confederate defenders. The Confederates unleashed protected volleys and whole clumps of men went down in the tall grass. The Irish regiments slowed at the crest and fought on until relieved. These Irish immigrants had to prove loyalty to their new American home, despite the anti-Irish feelings rampant throughout the North. They had to prove their love of the flag. This could be illustrated by the 63rd New York, whose colors were shot down 16 times. The Irish regiments left approximately 60% of their men dead and wounded on the field at Antietam. The Irish New Yorkers were joined in November 1862 by another Irish regiment, a Boston regiment, the 28th Massachusetts. And then an Irish regiment from Philadelphia, the 116th Pennsylvania. The two new regiments strengthened the brigade with needed manpower and all the troops were unified under the Green Irish and their red, white and blue American colors. On December 13, 1862, the brigade would continue and cement their hard-fighting reputation with their rush upon Confederate defenses at Marie's Heights in the disastrous Battle of Fredericksburg. Because the New York Irishmen were without their previously damaged green flags, General Carr had two orderlies distribute evergreen boxwood sprigs to the men to place in their caps. The brigade of approximately 1,400 officers and men rushed from the cover of the They attacked the heights, with many of the men raising the yell of in their native Gaelic, meaning clear the way. 
The Southern artillery concentrated on the Irish, who pushed hard for the Confederate defended stone wall. One Irishman called the flashes of muskets and artillery explosions blinding as they neared the Confederate position. General Mahar was shot from his horse by the shrapnel of an artillery round, and the brigade took cover to the churned and frozen ground, 30 yards from the wall, and traded shot for shot. The brigade fought, as at Antietam, until relieved. The brigade left on the field 53 of their 92 officers, killed and wounded, and almost 500 enlisted men gone forever. The Irish Brigade established a reputation for tenacity and stubbornness earned with blood. Their reputation ultimately marked the early identity of the Army of the Potomac. At both Chancellorsville and at Gettysburg in 1863, the brigade continued its excellent service, with many of the Irish patriots fighting on through Appomattox as part of reduced Irish brigade regiments. The men are still models of identity and heroism in Mr. Lincoln's army. The real maturity of the Army of the Potomac occurred when in 1862 winter quarters at Falmouth, Virginia, between the battles of Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville, while under the command of Fighting Joe Hooker. Though the men had served under McClellan and Burnside, Hooker was a proven fighting man who had a familiar attachment to his men that they enjoyed. Inside of those winter hut cities across the Rappahannock River from Fredericksburg, the veterans bonded with new recruits and everyone mended tattered uniforms, wrote letters, read soldier manuals, and lived for a few months out of the rain, mud, and snow. Hooker made them feel indestructible. He attempted to provide for them all sorts of rations and subtler goods, routine target practice to build the shooting confidence of the men, and had grand reviews to build the army to 120,000 men. He wanted the men to be ready to destroy Lee. The men would march from their huts in the spring of 1863, the best fed, best armed, and best trained they'd ever been. Gettysburg would prove that fact, but not with Hooker still in command. A unit that epitomized the dogged tenacity of Western men within the Eastern Army is the brigade composed originally of the 2nd, 6th, 7th Wisconsin, and the 19th Indiana Infantry. The men, who would soon form the Iron Brigade, attached their identity to their taller black army hats, the model 1858 army hat known as the Hardy. The man who brought that hat and the pre-war regular army uniform of a long frock coat to the volunteer Westerners was Brigadier General John Gibbon, a former instructor at West Point and a soldier who literally wrote the manual on how to be a soldier. Gibbon trained and expected the men to adhere to his rigid regular army standards, and the Iron Brigade proved themselves equal to any regular army organization. The first example of their iron will is the Battle of Brawner Farm during the Second Bull Run Campaign. On that hot August day in 1862, these men advanced up a slope and engaged a division of Stonewall Jackson's command on their own. The Westerners held their ground for an hour until the sun set and the battling slowed. This established their iron-strong identity at the loss of 900 men. The next month, at the Battle of South Mountain, the command advanced again up the side of Turner's Gap and did exactly what they had done at Brawner Farm, closing closer on the rebels. Admiring generals watching the attack made reference to the prowess of the men, perhaps using the descriptive word iron and some would call them the Iron Brigade 
from that day on. The Confederates called them the Black Hat Brigade. On July 1st, 1863, at the Battle of Gettysburg, the 24th Michigan would seal themselves with the Iron Brigade with both blood and iron. The brigade was rushed to the western suburbs of Gettysburg in order to hold their ground against the advance of three separate Confederate brigades. The brigade's black hats were much weathered and lacked some of the martial air they had when issued, but all on the field could make no mistake what troops stood at the forefront of the Army's 1st Corps defensive line, the 24th Michigan holding the center. The 1,400 Iron Brigade men were hit by 3,200 veteran Confederates, including the 26th North Carolina. The fight was a slugfest, a slow, bloody, point-blank retreat. The cost at Gettysburg was clear. Almost 1,200 men were left on the field. The 24th Michigan earned the respect of their Western comrades with the highest casualties of the brigade, 400 of their proximate 500 lost. The Iron Brigade would continue to fight with the Army of the Potomac, but it was never the same organization after Gettysburg. No replacements could replicate the original core of those brave 61 and 62 volunteers. Outside of combat, the life of the common soldier of the Army of the Potomac was like that of soldiers throughout history, marching, drilling, guard duty, and camp. The men mastered firemaking for the two most important needs of a soldier, cooking and warmth, and burning pilfered fence rails, the best type of instant dried firewood. With the issue and cooking of the rations, coffee became a daily ritual. Coffee was one of the few joys the soldier could find, and usually adding sugar satisfied the sweet tooth. Coffee boiling could be done in minutes, but the effect of caffeine on the body, a daily necessary drug. The cooking of the other staple rations could also be performed quickly if needed on campaign. Quickly frying the issue salted pork, boiling coffee, and munching their cracker-like hardtack would be what the Army wanted for its soldiers, quick prep, sustainable meals. Sometimes, just like the rebels after a battle, federal soldiers would pilfer dead Confederates' haversacks and look for things that they received more commonly than in the North, specifically tobacco and cornmeal. If camped near a farm or homestead, foraging for extra food also became commonplace, even if discouraged by officers. Federal soldiers would mix cornmeal with water, some foraged eggs, and bacon grease, resulting in a johnny cake, or fried cornbread that could be stowed into the haversack. When in more permanent or winter camps, the men would receive additional rations, like bread, flour, potatoes, onions, beans, and rice. If Billy Yank was really living good in camp, 
An army sutler might hang his shingle nearby where canned peaches and tomatoes or candy and other treats would force a soldier to part with his $13 a month pay. The men would become experts at one form of cooking or another and typically combine their foods and cooking implements into ad hoc groups of four to seven men called a mess. Several messes made up a company and the commissary officers would ensure the correct weight and distribution of rations. The canteen, the constant companion of a soldier, was his faucet if a spring, well, or stream were not found. Keeping the men with water could sometimes be more problematic than issuing rations. Once the men were in camp, there were a handful of responsibilities needing attention, especially making sure your musket was clean, rations cooked, and then making your house for the night. Mr. Lincoln's army, except when in winter huts, lived in the canvas houses known as dog tents or shelter tents. Each man was provided with an elongated square sheet of duck, about five and a half feet long, and bedecked with a few dozen bone buttons and buttonholes. Two men usually stuck their bayoneted muskets in the ground for end poles, then buttoning their two shelter tents together to form a long rectangular sheet. Two middle buttonholes were placed in the hammers of the two muskets, and sticks or issue wooden pegs were driven into the ground on each corner, a simple, easy, and primitive shelter from the sky. The men would use their Indian rubber blankets on the ground, sometimes atop pine needles or leaves as their mattresses. Their woolen issue blankets weighed between four and five pounds, and unless it was below freezing, would be wrapped around the men to keep them just warm enough. Pillows were fashioned from knapsacks or a bundle of extra shirt and socks. When not on duty and allowed to wander to amusements, the men craved a few things, such as reading newspapers to find more information on the war than in their immediate little corner of it. Apart from that, it was easy for men to transport playing cards and they would play several forms of betting games, at times betting their rations when they hadn't received pay for several months. The men would have boxing or wrestling matches, tossing messmates or drummer boys in a blanket, and when in more static camps, bigger games like baseball. Some men even dabbled in amusements that their families could never even comprehend like racing lice or ticks. But when the bugle or drum sounded, the men were ordered to pack up to move on to another campaign, and they did. The men carried their world in an issue knapsack, or more akin to just carry a few things in a horseshoe or looped blanket roll over their shoulder. A veteran soldier typically laid out his army blanket, placed an extra shirt and socks on it, folded it a dozen times, or rolled it, then twisted it slightly, tied the ends, and threw it over his head, and had it rest on either hip to his own comfort. Ethnic units, such as Mahar's Irish Brigade, demonstrated that recent immigrants would prove loyalty to their new nation with blood. Other ethnic soldiers especially German regiments, such as the 45th New York Infantry, demonstrated their strong Federalist loyalties and their abolitionist sentiments as well. The 45th New York and the other German regiments of the Army of the Potomac would raise and muster all German regiments, especially in immigrant strongholds such as New York and Cincinnati. The 45th New York was part of a strong group of New York City regiments and they took on the proud title of the 5th German Rifles. Their commander was Colonel George von Amsberg, an experienced soldier and a veteran of the Hungarian Revolution. A large portion of the officer corps of these German regiments had similar wartime experience in Europe. The 45th 
and many of its fellow regiments served in the 11th Corps of the Army of the Potomac. The Corps was built of a majority of German and European regiments, and many officers commanded their men in their German language to the disdain of their Anglo comrades. True dismay and distrust of the Germans came at the Battle of Chancellorsville in May 1863. The 11th Corps was caught in its flank by Stonewall Jackson's famous May 2nd attack. Several regiments of the 11th Corps, but not all German, could not even form their ranks, and the startled Yankees broke and ran. But the 45th New York fought well. But after this battle, the Germans were scapegoats for Hooker's defeat. Two months later, at Gettysburg and on the fields north of town, the 45th New York acted as an advance screen, finding the Confederate positions on Oak Hill. The entire 11th Corps took the field to reclaim their fighting reputation, and the Corps saved the Army of the Potomac from another complete rout and defeat in the streets of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania with legendary tenacity. The reputations for some of the best troops in the Army of the Potomac were built not upon the record of casualties taken or inflicted, but rather the fear they put into their Confederate enemy. One of those units was the Bucktail Brigade of General Roy Stone. Stone was a patriotic backwoodsman with no real prior military service, but coming in 1861, he left the very rural western mountains of Pennsylvania and mustered with his hunting rifle and dozens of other woodsmen like himself. A deer tail was found and placed in the caps of Stone's men, and their reputation as hunters became legendary. These mountain men were dead shots. Stone's company became a regiment and fought in many of the 1862 battles from the Shenandoah Valley to Antietam. Known as the first Pennsylvania rifles, the Bucktails were, in the words of one officer, a terror to the enemy. Stone then raised a brigade of qualified Bucktails. The 149th and 150th Pennsylvania regiments were formed. In due time, the 143rd Regiment would join the command. The Bucktails even carried special weapons, the Sharps rifle. And at Gettysburg, the brigade established itself by coupling this brutal accuracy with tactical excellence under their commander, Colonel Roy Stone. Stone was wounded, and the Bucktails left almost 900 of its 1,300 men on the fields at Gettysburg defending their home state. That combat experience made them a tough force in the spring campaign of 1864. Perhaps the unit who defined what the best of the Army of the Potomac was to be measured upon was the 1st Vermont Brigade consisting of the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, and 6th Infantry Regiments. This unit had no special uniform distinctions, save perhaps an occasional red blanket common to many New England regiments. Also, the Vermonters were keen on wearing the more formal frock coat as well as the soft black civilian slouch hat. Vermonters fought in the war early, through the Peninsula and Seven Day Battles, South Mountain, Antietam, Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, and they entered the 1864 campaign with an already established reputation as the cream of the crop of the hard-fighting Sixth Corps. Vermonters were either the first in the fight or last to leave one. In the Battle of the Wilderness on May 5th and 6th, 1864, the old Vermont Brigade, then commanded by Colonel Lewis Addison Grant, determined to not let the Army of Northern Virginia take their ground. In the two-day fight, the brigade lost almost 1,300 men killed and wounded. A week later, at Spotsylvania Courthouse, 
the brigade lost an additional 250 men. It was a bloody two weeks, with even more destruction at Cold Harbor to follow. In the last week of the war in Virginia, the brigade was the spearhead force to smash through the Confederate defenses on the south side of Petersburg at 5 a.m. on April 2nd, 1865, allowing for the collapse of the Confederate's Western Front. The Vermont Brigade sustained the most killed in action of any one Union Brigade in the entire war. This brigade was one of the best of Mr. Lincoln's army, as they had no flashy clothing, no ornaments, no specific ethnic definition, just tough Yankees who fought with the pure motivation of love for country and the old flag. Mr. Lincoln's army was trained by a system that was derived from the elite light infantry French chasseurs of the 1840s and 50s. Layers of training started with the laborers, farmers, and shopkeepers from across the Union becoming one. Not just by wearing blue uniforms, but by moving, standing, and firing as a single body of soldiers. One of the most popular drill manuals in the North at the start of the war was William J. Hardy's Light Infantry Tactics. Hardy, a former West Point instructor, was by then a Confederate general, an awkward challenge to the War Department. So Brigadier General Silas Casey published his version of Hardy's manual. This book, Casey's Tactics, was the unified drill manual for the Army of the Potomac from 1862 to the end of the war and beyond. Inspection arms was a familiar task at the start of every musket drill. Every Yankee soldier needed to become an expert at the applications of handling, loading, and firing his 58 caliber rifled musket. This is the position Attention. of a soldier. Shoulder, arm. Shoulder, arms. Notice the fingers around the trigger guard. Right shoulder shift, arms. Right shoulder shift, arms. Notice the placement of the right hand. Shoulder, arms. Shoulder, arms. Support. Arms. This position was used almost exclusively for resting Support. the musket when on guard duty. Arms. His left arm and hand parallel to the ground, not touching the opposite shoulder. Notice that the musket stands parallel to the body, not cocked to the rear. Yes. Attention. Notice Hold the placement there. of the right Arms. hand. Shoulder. Arm. Secure arms. This was used when a soldier needed to keep his muzzle out of the rain. Secure arms.
shoulder, arms, arms, port. Shoulder, arms. Order, arms. Order, arms. Notice the placement of the left hand. This places the musket alongside the soldier with the right hand in control. Trail, arms. This position was often used when moving quickly or through woods. The musket just high enough off the ground to successfully trot with a loaded weapon. Ground, arms. Ground, arms. Notice the placement of the left hand. Ground, arms. Raise, arms. Shoulder, arms, fix. The men would be trained how to fix and unfix their bayonet, and then eventually how to point fix. the bayonet to guard bayonet. or attack both infantry or cavalry. Shoulder, arms. Present, arms. Notice the placement of the left hand. Notice the eyes at the second barrel band. Shoulder, the musket even with the body. Arms. Used on formal parade or to salute a high-ranking officer, they would bring the musket straight before their bodies smartly in a literal presentation Shoulder, of his weapon. Arms. Order. Arms. Parade. Rest. Attention! Shoulder, arms! Charge! Bayonet! Notice the positions of the right and left arm. Charge! The muzzle even Bayonet. with the soldier's eyes. Shoulder! Arms. Shoulder. Arms. Guard against infantry. Guard. Shoulder. Arms. Shoulder. Arms. Guard against cavalry. Guard. Guard against cavalry found the bayonet pointing higher in the air. Shoulder. 
R. Order arms. No position was as important as load in nine times. The loading drill taught not only the steps in loading the musket, but for the officers established a standard rate of fire for his men and his company. The drill would begin with the order. Load in nine times. Load. The musket brought to the center of the feet in a snug but convenient handle. location Cartridge. to handle the rammer and to place eyes on the muzzle. Hand to his cartridge box, which held the 40 hand-rolled paper rounds. With a cartridge between the thumb and pointer finger, place the cartridge to the mouth, using Hair teeth cartridge. to open the powder end of the cartridge, bullet to the Cart front cartridge. of the muzzle. Dumping the gunpowder down the barrel, then squeezing the bullet into the muzzle. Draw rammer! Placing the tulip, or head, of the rammer upon the point of the bullet. Ram cartridge! Return rammer! In battle, many nervous soldiers would forget this and would shoot their rammers at the rebels. Try. The musket is now eased in front of the soldier. Muzzle down range at the height of the eye. Shoulder, arms. In battle, every man was supposed to finish the loading process in 15 to 20 seconds. Hey. By the book, Every man could shoot three rounds per minute. Each company of 90 muskets could fire 270 rounds per minute. Every regiment of 10 companies could fire 2,700 rounds per minute. By the Middle War period, the average strength of a regiment in the Army of the Potomac was 400 men. Firing three rounds per minute a veteran regiment could easily expend 12,000 rounds in a 10-minute firefight. At the Battle of Gettysburg, the high tide of the war, Mr. Lincoln's Army of the Potomac had grown into a perfect killing machine. In May and June of 1864, fighting changed from open warfare, Napoleonic tactics, to trench fighting. The Army of the Potomac would be forced to use the bayonet to drive Lee's army out of its trenches. The last year of the Civil War in the East was full of frontal assault after frontal assault. Even with the previously inconceivable combat losses under Grant's direct command, the proud Army of the Potomac resolved to stick to it and eventually destroyed the Army of Northern Virginia.
Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.